In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we are in the period of the church year called the Great 50 Days. It's the time from the day of resurrection until the day of Pentecost when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit comes upon us. But in Scripture today, even though we are two weeks away from Easter, in our Scripture, it is still Resurrection Day. It is still that Sunday in what is taking place in the Gospel of Luke. And it begins by this. While they were still talking about this, a little study hint. When you read something like that, while they were still, well, what were they talking about? And so it's important to kind of back up a little bit and see what was taking place. And this is what was happening again. It's the day of resurrection. In the Gospel of Luke, we do not have a doubting Thomas story. We barely have an in the upper room story. What we do have is two disciples who, in their grief, think, it's done. He's dead. We're not sure what to do. And very often, when we're not sure what to do, we go back to doing what we did before. And so they are on this seven-mile journey back to the town of Emmaus. And as they're walking along, all of a sudden, Jesus appears among them, but ironically, they don't see it. And I think in that is a little lesson that when we are in times of grief, when we are in times of sorrow, when we are wounded and hurting, we don't always see what we need to see. Amen? We get stuck in that. It's, it's, it's a brokenness in our life. And so they're moving along, and they're talking, and he asks them, um, what are you discussing? What are you talking about? And they're funny. They're like, are you the only one in Jerusalem that hasn't heard what went on last weekend? And so they begin to witness to what they saw. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and before all people. And the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to a sentence of death. And they crucified him. And we had hoped that he would be the one that we were looking for. We had hoped he would be the promised one, the Messiah. But it was more in the third day he said he would come back. And our women were even amazed it was an empty tomb. But because they hadn't seen Jesus, even though ironically they're in the middle of talking to him, they were still downhearted, broken hearted. And so as they continue to walk, they're engaging in discussion. It's getting late. And they say, well, Jesus, don't, don't go on. They don't say, Jesus, sir, don't go on. Come and have, have dinner with us. We'd love to have you join us. And so as they sat down at table, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, handed it to them. And in that moment of sacramental clarity, they see that it's Jesus and their hearts are warmed. And in that instant, he evaporates, he disappears. And they go, well, didn't you feel that? You know, they go, now they're justifying. <laughs> I thought it was him. No, you didn't. You know, they kind of go back and forth. And they literally get up from dinner, walk back the seven miles so that they could tell their friends in Jerusalem, the other disciples, what was taking place. While they were still talking about this, so that's what happened, Jesus now shows up in their midst yet again. And he says this, peace be with you. Who wants a little more peace in their life? We are surrounded by chaos in the world in ways that maybe it's just because we get data in, in 24 seconds from around the world. I'm not sure, but it's getting pretty rough out there. And Jesus reminds us today the importance of peace in our life. Peace be with you. And they were startled and they thinking he was a, a ghost. And so Luke gives us three proofs of his resurrection. The first one is that he is there, and he shows them physically in body. See my hands again. See my side. See the wounds in my feet. I am flesh and blood. And then he begins to sit down and says, I'm hungry. Can I have something to eat? And begins to eat with them. He said, this is what I told you when I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written from the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And I love this. And then he opened their minds. It's 
so they could understand Scripture. What a gift that must have been. But see, that is the gift that's available to us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. That if we are obedient, if we are open, God will open us because his word is alive and breathing and effectual. I love it. We in the Episcopal Church, if you don't know, run on what's called a three-year lectionary. We rotate the same readings over a three-year period, and then we start all over again. So now that I've been a priest for 20 years, I've done this cycle a number of times. And it'll be always interesting. I look back and go, what did I preach on this topic three years ago? And first, I usually go, ooh, what was I thinking? That's horrible. (laughs) But more importantly, I read it again, and something new, something different, something vital pops out because I'm not where I was three years ago. I hope the church isn't where it was three years ago. And I believe that God speaks to us in new and fresh ways when we engage in his word with an open mind to hear something new, to be fed by his word in that sense. And so he opens their minds to scripture and said, this is what was written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead. And on the third day, repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. And you are my witnesses to this. You have seen, you have experienced, you have been front and center to the miracles, to the healings, to the feeding of the 5,000, to the crucifixion, and now to resurrection glory. What does it mean to be a witness? Well, first we experience something or we see something. And then we are called to report what we've seen honestly. In court, they make you take an oath before you are a witness. Hand on the Bible. Do you swear that the evidence you're about to give will be the truth, and not just the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And we respond, I do. We take an oath that truth is vital. And what we learned today is that for there to be peace in our life, for there to be peace in the world, there must be a foundation of truth that it's built on. Deception, distortion does not bode well for relationship building, does it? If you've ever been told half-truths by somebody you trust, by somebody you love, it breaks down the relationship. And what I tell, we had a beautiful wedding yesterday, I'll go into that in a little bit, But what I tell couples is that all intimacy is built on trust and respect within a relationship. If there's no trust, you can't open yourself up to death. If there's no respect, how do you honor the unique gifts and talents and personality styles that we each have? And so truth must be the foundation, no matter how crazy, no matter how no matter how challenging, no matter how convenient, because sometimes truth in our life can, we feel, be inconvenient. Pushes us out of our safe place, out of you. I don't know about you, but I like in my life to have all of my boxes ordered in alphabetical order, and God is a loving God that says, bink, 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 Jim, (laughs) I want you to put them in the order I give you, not the order you desire. But truth, again, is the basis of this witness. And we hear in Scripture, the truth will set you free. If you've ever had a burden on your heart, and you finally, either in confession or talking with someone you love, you speak that truth, it's freedom, isn't it? It's freedom. Truth is so important, in fact, that there's a penalty called perjury if you don't speak the truth in a court of law. Now, however, there can be no truth if there's no freedom to speak the truth. We are reminded that the source of God's love, the core of God's love, is found in free will. This incredible, counterintuitive notion that love cannot happen, real, authentic love has to have freedom as the potting soil in which it grows and blossoms. 
again in this beautiful wedding that I got a uh, chance to celebrate yesterday, there is a section of a wedding, and I'm sure you know this, called the Declaration of Consent. It sounds very much like the vows, but what it does, it invites the person to say, I am here on my own free will. There's no check being written, no shotgun in the background. I'm here because I choose to be here. I'm here because I want to declare my love for the person across from me. And they are asked this question. Will you have this man or woman to be your husband or wife, to live together in the covenant of marriage? Will you love, comfort, honor, and keep in sickness and in health, forsaking all others as long as you both shall live? And the response is, I will. By the way, a little note here, it's not I do like we see in the movies. And so those of you that are English teachers, I'm going to slash this a little bit, but I do is a present tense imperative. I do now, I might not tomorrow. I will is a future continuous. I will, I will strive every day to be the best husband, to be the best wife, to be the best spouse that I can be. Some days will be great, some days won't, but I will do this and give it my best shot every single day day. In a few minutes, we're going to have a baptism. We bring the Howell children forward to be bathed in the waters of baptism that we die to ourselves and be reborn again. And we will be witness to the sacramental act. And not only witness to it, but we engage in it, don't we? We will be asked, well, all of you who witness this, do all in your power to uphold these young people in their baptismal vows. Very much like a wedding. I emphasize this at a wedding. We ask people, will all of you who witness these, these promises do all in your power to take care of them? And they say, we will. And I always want them to really lean into that because when we're at a wedding, we're not just there because someone picked us up off the street. We're a family. We're a friend. We're intimately connected. And as we know... Family and friends aren't always helpful when couples are in trouble. Sometimes we turn couples away from each other thinking we're doing the best thing instead of turning them toward one another, praying for them, honoring them. It was an old tradition back in Hebrew times that when a new couple got married and they went into where they lived in the tribe or in the village, nobody was allowed in their house for a year. That gave them a chance to set their authority to set their relationship and so we will say we will support these children as they are baptized and brought into the covenant of sacramental promises that God gives us freedom gives us the chance to speak truth truth invites peace in our life and we can be a witness to that process. As the disciples were a witness to what Christ called them to, we are to be witness here. And as Christ invites them to peace, he opens their minds so that they could understand Scripture in a brand new way because his word is the way, the truth, and the life. That is another process that we are invited into. That if we follow the way of Christ, how he did it, how he extended love and care and compassion and redemption, and we follow that, then we are brought to new truth in our life and given not only new life in this world, but in the world to come. My hope always is, as your rector, is to help you have a worldview, a Christian worldview on which to look upon the world. And that we understand that our God is a God of peace, not a God of chaos. He takes chaos and brings it into order. So whenever we see chaos in our world, we wonder, is that of God or not? Our God is a God of joy, not a God of anger. Our God is not a God of anxiety or fear, but again, a God of peace, a God of blessing. My hope is that as we join together in the coming years on this journey of the Spirit, that our eyes will be open to new truths about who we are individually, but who we are as a parish, and what is God calling us to in this season of life and love, that we may allow His light to shine in a profound way, and that we will be agents 
of peace, agents of truth in our lives. But that begins not just within a congregational setting. It begins in every decision and every choice that we make. Are we living boldly into the truth of what God calls us to? Because sometimes it is challenging. And it calls us to stand firm in grace and in love to present that truth to one another, but also to be willing to hear it when someone brings it to you as well. So brothers and sisters, may the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of God, but more importantly, of his Son, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.